please be seated, ladies and gentlemen. Please be seated, ladies and gentlemen. We're on to plenary session 13, strengthening social protection for future of work, skilling, and mobility. And we have on our panel Ms. Bettina Schaller, President, World Employment Confederation, Belgium. Mr. Johnny Taylor, Jr., President and Chief Executive Officer, Society for Human Resource Management, USA. Ms. Renate Hormon Draus, the Managing Director, Economic and International Affairs, Confederation of German Employers Associations, IOE Vice President to the ILO and the Spokesperson of the Employers Group, Bruce Downton, MD and uh, Vice Chancellor and President of Macquarie University Australia, Alan Blue, Co-Founder, LinkedIn US, and to moderate, we've got Ms. Shobna Kamineni, Executive Vice Chairperson of Apollo Hospitals. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I know this is the last session, so we're going to keep it into a very lively 45 minute discussion. Um, and I really think that it's important, you know, that it's sometime during the day, and even if it's at the end of the day, we have to recognize that we have to, uh, we have to work and we have to do a, a lot of planning for what's most imp the most important asset for us to run our business, and that's people. So this session on strengthening social protection for the future of work, skilling, and mobility I think is very important in this day in, in, in the future of work. So I'm privileged to be joined by a most distinguished panel of speakers uh, with, and who have traveled quite far to be here with me today. Um, their introductions have been made. And um, I just want to say that um, I want to thank my panel because uh, we were all part, there were about 172 of us uh, from, uh, from 20, uh, from all the G20 countries and seven more who joined this and we had, um, what we did is that over the last six months we actually put together a paper that we think it will be practical recommendations but very, very come from the deep knowledge that especially my co-chairs here have and, and who have very, very generously shared with us. So thank you all for just for traveling, being here with us, sharing uh, what for in the next 45 minutes, uh, what you do and how you do it. But I think most importantly, the fact that we've worked together to make sure that the culmination of this B20 will, will actually become a very powerful platform of actionable insights. And getting into those insights, you know, we have three pillars, and I spoke about them yesterday, those that weren't there very quickly. We collectively decided that those three pillars would work around the first one, fostering inclusive and sustainable growth in the transforming world of work. The second one, accelerate workforce skilling to adapt to changing industry demand. And the third is boost global workforce mobility uh, to match skill demand with supply. And all of you know, I don't have to speak about it because you've seen that uh, technology has played such a great part. It's actually uh, created, you know, um, a fundamental metaphor, metamorphosis. 
and um, you know of, of how people work, where they work from, and also you know the the way that jobs and and, and what's required. And we do requ we do know that skilling is is essential now. Skilling, upskilling, reskilling. And how can we make this more effective, let it be, and, and make sure that it doesn't create barriers but actually becomes more inclusive and understand the fact that there, that there are going to be a lot of people that are going to be, you know, that, that, uh, you know coming into the workforce, especially from, uh, especially from the global south, that you're going to have a large population of young people who are going to look for, you know, I, I read a study from the World Economic Forum. They did the largest study on, on uh, 16 year olds to 24 year olds. And from many countries, in fact, 12% of them were from India. And what they said, 41% of them said that uh, they, really were, they, they really wanted uh, to be employable. They wanted an education that would connect them to employability. And I think that is so important for all of us to understand. And this is something that we have recognized and put into our recommendations. So how will this all happen, you know? And it requires the collective of businesses, of academic institutions, ed tech platforms, and also individuals that we need to come together to see how we can make, uh, you know, how, how we can make this, um, uh, this entire uh, uh, this, uh, the, the, this, this entire challenge of creating more jobs, productivity, of being able to reskill people, and in doing so, as I said yesterday, it's so important because you know when 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 you have people in productive jobs and great livelihoods, when you can engage them, and and this is not an engagement that you know I think you're seeing uh, people entering into the workforce whenever they want, dropping out whenever they want and actually staying on so much longer than we ever thought before. Uh, my dad is 90 and he still comes to work every day. We're going to see more and more of this. And I think the fact that a 102 year old can get a Nobel Prize, these are all evolutions of what you're going to see in the future. Today they might seem you know, like um, anomalies of this system, but believe me in the next 10 years, in this decade, we alone will see way more change happening. And the very fact that there's generative AI and so much of this. And I just want to end by saying that, you know, uh, when, when we, the more that we can do to stabilize this, to be able to create systems, to be able to define it, which we've tried to do in this document, the 60 page document that we're giving the ministers uh, two weeks from now, when you can do that, that's the time that we can actually push forward to say that, you know, when they say one world, a one world is only one world when, when there are more people who are actually, that have the right livelihoods to be able to raise families and be that one world. And, and with me today, all I can say is that you will be listening to the perfect people, the right people who understand the, they understand the situation, they understand from their deep experience and the leadership of the organizations they represent. They're the people who will actually be able to tell us uh, uh, more and more about how this world is changing, what's important about this, about a changing workforce, about mobility, about skilling. And I think that um, I want to thank them and I want to thank all of you for being here and listening to us today. I hope that um, you leave with, uh, with a wealth of new information and, and actually some very interesting new perspectives. So I have act uh, I've requested each one of our, uh, each one of our panelists so to spend five minutes talking about what they do and what's important and how it connects into what we did into this document. And after that, maybe we can get some questions in. But thank you all for being here. So uh, my participants, have, uh, my panelists have said that it's much more uh, informal to do a chat with all of you and just sit here. But uh, may I request Ms. Bettina Schala? She's the president of the World Employment Con Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, of, of the, of the uh, World Employment Confederation of Belgium. And I'd like you to be our first speaker and 
tell us some of the things you do, and maybe you know you can really talk about the changing work landscape also, and some of the innovative uh, processes that you've put in place. With the greatest of pleasure, uh, Shoban, and allow me first to salute you for your chairmanship of this uh, specific okay. task force, and thank you, and of course, also CII and all the partners. What an amazing event, you know. I've been involved with the B20 process for the past 12 years, and I must say, this has been absolutely unique. Now, when it comes to the task force, of course, and the work uh, that we engaged in in November last year, we actually started quite, um, what should I say, in a vibrant way, because there were so many different opinions around the table that really reflected the, let me say, humongosity of the task, right? I mean, how do you come to a report? And you said uh, yesterday that it's the shortest report, I believe, that we are submitting. It's only 60 pages, ladies and gentlemen. So how do we get to a report that really, you know, hits the nail on what right now, in August 2023, uh, reflects the big priorities. And we had to um, come, as you do in such processes, to um, some negotiations. And the result that we have today, I think, is both the reflection of a process that, of course, for an international community that is involved every year, should be building on what um, was discussed before, and should also reflect what is being discussed in the international arena because there are many organizations that are looking at labor market regulation right now. We actually have an eminent representative in the person of Renate, you will share with us just now. So we have the International Labor Organization, we have uh, the OECD, uh, we have other spaces that are discussing um, labor market policy. So to come back, this report, of course, needed to reflect um, all of that. And it should absolutely also reflect the priorities of India and where it stands today. And let me maybe just a personal comment. The learning that I have had over the past months on the incredible path that India is on has really personally been uh, the, the greatest joy for me. Now, World Employment Confederation is the advocacy organization for the jobs industry. It's the private employment services solutions uh, industry. So my members are the biggest companies in the world that provide, well, staffing, recruitment, placement, outsourcing, outplacement, uh, career transitioning, training, basically every solution that companies need and every solution that workers need. We have so far on a yearly basis given work to 60 million workers across the world. And since we stand for the organized, the ethical, the very compliant side of an industry that is very fragmented, I have members from 50 national associations, one of them being the Indian Staffing Federation. So what was my focus as I got involved in this task force? It was to bring to the table, of course, the perspective of my industry, my employers, um, but importantly, a very specific angle, which is the one that flexibility is absolutely key and that with the evolution that labor markets are under, we need to build frameworks that allow for flexibility and frameworks that allow for people to be not necessarily only employed directly with companies, but to use other forms of contract as well. These diverse forms of work, as it is known in the institutional work, are reflected in the recommendations as well. And so I am very pleased that we were able also in this report under this presidency to include the fact that more and more workers who are looking for the freedom to choose of how to work, that all those workers who are, for instance, in the gig economy, that all those workers who are in the informal economy but need to be taken care of as well, that we looked for ways and policy ways for them to be considered. And we did so in the three chapters. 
be it in the uh, inclusion area, be it in the skills area, or in the talent mobility area. I can't wait for this discussion, and I will be back, but for now, back to you, Chair. That was excellent, thank you. I think you uh, really brought it to life of what we did and, the, and, and actually the, the great debates that we've had um, and, and the fact that, you know, they've, uh, uh, we've had, you know, almost 14 different uh, consultations with this thing. And uh, Renate, thank you for hosting, actually, that you did it simultaneously between Delhi and Geneva. But thank you for, you, for your remarks, Bettina. Uh, I'd like to move on to our next speaker, that Mr. Johnny Taylor. Um, he is the president and CEO of the Society for Human Resource Management, uh, SHRM. And um, even though it says USA, he has more than 28,000 members in India with yes, us, and, yes. and, and more than 350,000 members worldwide. So you really have an experience, and most of these, I think, are tech workers in that space. So. Please share your perspectives with regard to this report and also the, the changing the nature of work. Yes, thank you very much. And to Madam Chair, thank you for your leadership. Uh, too often, people don't understand the work that's going on behind the scenes by leaders like you. And this is globally relevant. To each of you and my fellow panelists, uh, thank you for the work that you've undertaken for the last several months. Let me tell you just briefly, SHRM, the world's largest professional association for HR professionals. We're in 165 countries. We have 326,000 individual members. Of course, we're based in the United States, but much, I think, will be great news to you. India is absolutely our growth engine. We now have three offices in Mumbai, Delhi, and Bangalore. Uh, we are growing every day, and it's because the world is here, right? Thank you. Uh, given that I represent, through my colleagues at SHRM, the HR profession, this is a particularly relevant conversation for us because it's not just the U.S. Uh, there's some opportunities and some learnings to come from the U.S., some of what we learned that we did well and some of it that we weren't so great at. And we're able to share that with the world and really figure out how to have a different path forward. So India. Uh, just yesterday, I met with some of the largest employers in India, the CHROs, in our hotel to have a discussion about where you are 75 years into this journey. And we were able to discuss some of what we learned in our near 250-year journey in the United States. Again, some things we did well, some things not so well. Uh, but what we know for sure is change is real and it's happening. As we talk about the future of work, the worker and the workplace. All we have to think is, you know, think back three years from now. I often refer to March 13th, 2020, the day when most of the world, we call it, uh, you know, the darkest Friday of our times, but it was the time when we realized that the world of work would forever change with COVID. What we learned was that COVID presented an existential threat to human beings on two levels, to their lives, and their livelihoods. So both of those were being threatened at once. And at that time, the human resources professionals who had before that really been seen as an administrative function, payroll, benefits, employee relations, were dragged to lead and ensure that we were taking care of our most important asset, our people. Because without the people in a knowledge-based economy, our businesses would not thrive. What we've taken away from that is that disruptor that moment in time has forever changed the landscape of work. And that's why it's critical that we have convenings such as this, where we have our colleagues from higher ed in the room. We have government leaders in the room. We have partnerships through international associations and, my friends, industry. All of us together, as we convene and share our learnings together, will be able to make a difference when we talk about issues of skilling and reskilling. And I'm so glad, Madam Chair, that you mentioned the importance. We talk about skilling a lot because India is very young 
and you have a ton population wise of people. You're actually going to be able to export people and talent to the rest of the world. Lest we forget, though, that for the first time in modern history, frankly, in history period, we have five generations in the workplace. So it's not just skilling the 13 year old and the 23 year old, we've got to reskill the 60 year old. And the entire world is struggling right now with replenishment. We have more work than we have people, people who have the right skills. And so this is a real fundamental challenge for each of us. I will end with this. I was with a group of Fortune 500 CEOs. We have 95% of the Fortune 500 are SHRM members. And as they were sitting down, they said, Johnny, and I'll never forget this line. He said, in times past, we had to worry about accessing financial capital. He said, our challenge now is accessing human capital. The world is filled with cash. He said, in fact, we're, we're financing some bad ideas. So <laughs> financial capital is not the issue. The threat to us all is sufficient human capital with the right skills, and that includes technical skills as well as workplace skills. That's the challenge before us, and that's why I'm so honored to join this panel because we did some amazing work. It's 60 pages, but it's 60 pages worth reading. Thank you so much, Johnny. I think your perspectives were, were just not only, you know, uh, very relevant for everyone sitting here, but it connected into some of the challenges that, that we see, where, whichever, wherever uh, uh, we come from around the world, that these are real life challenges. And, and five generations in the workforce never realized it. And I think it's definitely there in every country. But uh, I'd like to really move on now to our next speaker, uh, Ms. Renate Hornung Drauss. She's the Managing Director for Economic and in International Affairs of the Confederation of German Employers Associations. And uh, she not only has a wealth of experience in working with, uh, with, with you know, the B20 and giving many, many years of recommendations, but, uh, and, but she's been a force in, in building our document also. So thank you first, and may we have your remarks, please. Thank you, Shabana. And let me start by congratulating CII and you for this excellent B20. And of course, of course, it's not only this summit, which is the culmination of the whole exercise, but it has been very intensive work, as you yourself said, over the last 12 months which was really, really very well done, and thank you very much for this. The fact that more than 170 members joined this task force on the future of work, skilling, and mobility is actually uh, really an indicator for the importance of the subject and for the quality of the discussions we have had. So thank you again. And what, let me say also um, a word about India. As I came here, I was really struck by the vibrant energy, the positive, constructive dynamic I see here all around, the companies, the people on the street, everybody wants to develop, wants to move. There is huge development, and that's very heartening to see. So really, congratulations for all you have achieved over the last 10, 15, 20 years in India. What I would like to uh, say in my words of introduction is just to focus on the three points, future of work, skilling and mobility, just make some comments to trigger the discussion afterwards. Well, the future of work, of course, people keep asking us, what skills do you need for the future of work? And of course, the answer is, we don't know, we don't. they evolve. But that's very important for the regulatory environment we are in. Because what we observe is that regulation is really geared to the past. And if we want the future of work to be able to evolve, to unfold properly, regulation must be more flexible. It must be less bureaucratic. And as Bettina said, it must allow for open, dynamic, and inclusive labor markets. And there's a lot of room for improvement in all our countries. In India, as well as in Germany, my own country, in France, even in Switzerland, Bettina, even labor law in Switzerland is much less bureaucratic than in many other countries. Um, the second point about skilling. I think 
the basis for skilling is actually a very robust general education providing basic skills. And unfortunately, we are not doing well on that. We see when we look at OECD analysis that actually the level of basic skills of school children is declining. And that's not good. We should make sure that they really learn to read, to write, to think logically in school. And that's a big responsibility because this is the basis also for then developing the skills needed on the labor market. And when we come to this issue, the skills needed on the labor market for employability, for being open precisely to the future of work, the skills needed, to adapt to the skills needed, what is so important is that there is a very close connection between the reality of work, the employers, the businesses, and the schools, the vocational education, the vocational training. Um, and here I would like to first quote my, my own country, Germany. We have a very long tradition of apprenticeship as a basis for vocational education, which works basically in partnership between companies, even SMEs, employers, giving young people an apprenticeship contract, which is a fixed term contract, but it is for two years. They take on the responsibility to educate them in the specific profession they have chosen and the public institutions which provide the vocational schools and the um, uh, sort of theoretical um, element of knowledge they need to know for this profession. And I'm very proud and very happy to see that in the International Labour Organization, just this summer, uh, we adopted the recommendation 208. We always go by figures in the ILO because we have so many of them, which is about promoting apprenticeship. And this is something I can really recommend to every country. Of course, we all have our different traditions, but bringing businesses, employers, and public administrations closer to each other is something extremely important and very positive to allow also for adapting the skills we need for tomorrow. Now, to conclude, just um, two reflections on mobility. I think mobility has two dimensions. One of them is geographical mobility, and we tend to, dis to discuss only about geographical mobility. Of course, when we look at the G20, on geographical mobility, there is a lot of room for good cooperation. Look at the demographics. Take India. We have, a, as um, Johnny just said, India has a very, very large and very young population. And there are not enough jobs for all the young, well-qualified people who are looking for jobs in India. On the other hand, we have other G20 countries. Take my own country, Germany, or Japan, or other countries who have a completely different demography. So that could be a real win-win situation if we were to facilitate um, migration, uh, mobility between these two countries. Um, and we do have frameworks like the Global Compact for Migration. What we need to have there is also a, um, a, um, a cooperation also with public administration because it's not only about businesses wanting to hire young people from India, but it's also the administrations, the visa, the work permits, the bureaucracies where we need to work at. And the second dimension is professional mobility, to move from one job to another. And I think that's the one topic we also probably want to further discuss at future B20 um, meetings. All this will hopefully then lead to reduce informality, which is an issue for many of our countries. And I think we are really well placed with the recommendations we made in our future of work uh, task force to uh, improve these um, situations in all our countries. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I really like that point about uh, mobility, which means changing professions, which is pretty much an introduce, uh, introduction to our next speaker, who, who, was a, uh, who was a doctor practicing in one of the finest institutions in the world in Mass General, and then took on a, uh, a career to become the vice chancellor and president of the Macquarie University, and not only, and you shifted continents. So it's a very interesting perspective that uh, uh, you don't have to stick to mobility. There's so much more that we'd like to hear from you, Bruce. But uh, thank you so much for being here, and we'd love to hear your perspective on this report and, uh, and what you do in terms of education, because that's fundamental, I think, to building the foundation for, 
uh, for, for this entire conversation. Well, thank you very much, and it's a great pleasure to be here with you all today with my distinguished uh, panel colleagues and with a wonderful audience here. I bring you all greetings, of course, from Australia, uh, a country which shares so much in so many ways uh, with India, and particularly, I suspect, um, I might be the only one on the stage here, along with many colleagues here who understands the sport uh, cricket. Uh, but um, that's another story for another day. Um, just some observations for you. As I look out at the world that we are so challenged for workforce development uh, these days, as a leading an education institution and having worked all over the world in healthcare, including workforce development in a past life, I think it's an inflection point in our history, sped up by COVID has already been indicated, that we are facing the need <clears throat> for dramatic innovation. The sort of innovation you have in your businesses <clears throat> is the sort of innovation that we need in many other ways as well. <clears throat> and if, I'm just going to give you a couple of highlights of areas where I think innovation is needed. The first one is in the models of workforce development. I think we have to ask ourselves questions about how the models that have stood us well over the recent uh, century and have evolved over that time are not going to serve us well going forwards. It is going to require greater um, innovation in the models of workforce development. And that's going to require people to take risks, all of us, education institutions, governments and businesses. We have a very interesting experiment going on in Sydney and Australia right now where two universities, one of them mine, Macquarie University, um, a vocational training organisation, the government of my state and Microsoft have come together to develop a new institute of applied technology around digital skills to rapidly become uh, the major provider of um, a cyber security range for short and fast training programmes for industry and for students from many walks of life who want incisive, quick education around uh, digital skilling. We will need much more of that sort of innovation in the models of education. The fundamentals of pedagogy, how we teach, are also rapidly evolving. And these are evolving not only, but certainly partly because of the advent of machine learning in education, a profound challenge for education institutions. One which I personally see not only as challenging, but also providing incredible opportunity to harness the power of AI and machine learning tools to elevate the learning skills to higher levels of cognition than we might have been previously able to do. I think that's a very exciting area. But threaded throughout what I've already said and what several of my colleagues have already referred to, is the need really for innovation in the area of collaboration within and particularly across sectors, across government, industry, non-government organisations and education institutions, whether they are universities, vocational training organisations. We need to move beyond the traditional paradigms where we get stuck in our silos and we need to attack, as already been referred to, the regulatory area is going to need dramatic change. In areas such as uh, migration policy, uh, certainly my own country has been thinking very hard about that. India has, many other countries have as well. The sort of collaboration that can happen between governments when they really decide to move the dial, I think an emblem of that is that in the last 12 months, India and Australia signed change agreements around reciprocity of skills recognition and qualification recognition between our, our two countries. We need more of that in my view, countries collaborating across national boundaries to really promote uh, migration um, of skilled workforce. I think we also need to think about innovation in the area that starts before the traditional thinking about workforce development. Renata already referred to the importance of thinking about what happens in schools. The mindset around employability and employment opportunity and career direction is being set earlier and earlier 
and there needs to be collaboration, in my view, across the continuum of the education spectrum from grade school, high school, tertiary education, whether it's university, uh, vocational education, education that happens within industries. Many of you are doing that now. And I think um, we will need to think about the whole continuum. If I might close with just a couple of warning bells. <clears throat> As we think about the rapid technologic evolution that's happening around the world today, we're all crying out for needs of staff with technology, science, engineering, computer science skills. And that is a recognised reality. I would urge us to remember that those fields as a standalone deny the reality that Georg Hegel the great German philosopher uh, opined upon when he said, what we have learned from history is that we have not learned from history. Ignoring the humanities, arts and social sciences as disciplines, we will do at our peril. Why do I say that? It fundamentally comes down to something that I think is very important in thinking about our futures of our workforces and that is creating the sense of belonging. Of belonging to an organisation that might not be a short term move around as has become so much the norm. There are outstanding corporate examples of folks who have kept employee loyalty and sustained that even through COVID, which I think are real exemplars for us. And that is particularly profoundly important, I think, when we contemplate what is talked about in the report, which is the mental health emerging problems in workforces of today, particularly among young people. It is alarming to read recently the statistic that in 18 to 26 year olds, more than 40% in one recent study have diagnosable mental health conditions. The real challenge for us all, to me, lies in between the need for innovation in the digital space at the same time as belonging to something larger than oneself. Thank you so much, Chair. Very, very inspiring. Thank you so much. Just want to ask the audience a question. Who, is, who all are on LinkedIn? Yeah, I knew. <laughs> and, and even those that are not, cannot admit it, because you're, you're fundamental. Well, here's one of the co-founders of Link, LinkedIn. So I think it's a unique opportunity to, <laughs> to meet Alan Blue and, and let him give us our perspective, give a perspective and not only has he been a part of our panel, but what he's, I think that what he'll bring is really the pressing question of today. How is this generative AI going to destroy jobs? And just before coming in, or maybe create jobs, but they say that, you know, we're going to lose 85 million jobs and 65 million new ones will be created of a completely different category on one side. And on the other side, let me share this, please, but he is part of the, uh, his wife is part of the entertainment industry Who's, who's actually a writer. And one of the things is that she's sitting outside, you know, as you know, the writer strike in the US that, that's gonna go on. And are we going to see this? Is this going to become commonplace because of generative AI of many of your other employer, you know, the, the unions that, that will say, look, we're displaced from jobs. Is that going to be a thing? So is there, do we need to be afraid? Uh, thanks but, very much. But, but keep some good stuff, please. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's the um, end of the day. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you and congratulations, everyone, on the amazing work and leading this conversation forward. It's very important for all of us to participate in it. Um, I was uh, able to attend the, uh, uh, the last COP, the last uh, climate change conference in Sharm el-Sheikh um, uh, late last year. And uh, one of the amazing things about it and one of the things which was very positive, I was happy to share with everyone, was how much progress was really being made in the world of climate. Um, it's something people believe nothing is happening in, but that's not true. 
But the fascinating thing about it was that the conversations had turned from should we do something to yes, now we're going to do something, but who's going to do it? Because we don't really know how to build up the level of green skills that we actually need. And all of us as employers are feeling pressure for ESGs. How do we move into an environmentally sensitive world? How do we build diversity in our companies? And all of us are also dealing with the world of remote work. Um, that has changed for many of us the way that our, <clears throat> the way that our companies actually operate. And these are all very hard problems. They're all happening at the same time. They are multiplied by the advent of artificial intelligence. So what's the solution? How do we all address these things? And I think a big part of it is going to be what has come up over and over again on, in this conversation, which is around skills and around skill-based hiring. So um, this is something we've been concentrating on at LinkedIn. It's something which actually can very substantially increment your pipeline as employers. As we do research on this, with the data from LinkedIn and from employers hiring on LinkedIn, right now it looks like making skill-based hiring decisions increases the talent pool you are drawing from by a factor of 10 which is an amazing thing, whether you're trying to uh, attract green skills, whether you're trying to build a more diverse culture and workplace, whether you're trying to adjust to the new world of work, skills and skill-based hiring is a gigantic component of that solution going forward. So it's a huge opportunity. It's also a huge challenge for all of us because at LinkedIn, we know that we have I mean, even LinkedIn, we have some fairly old-fashioned notions of hiring sometimes. We don't always do skill-based hiring. Um, so last year, we began to track the number of jobs that we do, hiring for our own company, which do not require bachelor's degrees, and instead are based on hiring for skills alone. And it actually has made a huge difference in terms of the number of people who we can consider for roles at LinkedIn. That's one of the changes that all of us are going to need to make. So in the spirit of practicality, um, I wanted to talk about a couple other things briefly that we all need to do, especially as employers, to make that transition possible. So the first one is you need to reorient your jobs to make sure you're hiring for skills. LinkedIn will help with this, and we have new tools are coming out. We have some existing ones and new tools coming out to help you do that. But obviously, however you hire, you need to make that change. Um, the second thing is, and, and maybe the most important thing, and probably where I'll leave this in the interest of time, is it actually requires a pretty substantial cultural change for all of us, the same as it has for LinkedIn. If you are hiring based on skills, you are hiring people who are actually different. They have different lived experiences than the people who are currently working for your company. And you will probably notice that some of the new people who come in via skill-based hiring may have a harder time being successful at your company than the people who come from familiar backgrounds. And that's up to all of us as employers to make sure that if we're going to make the world of skill-based hiring actually work, then we need to make sure that our managers, our HR professionals, and our the people who work for us are ready to include the people who come from different places and different backgrounds at our companies. So there's much to say about all of that. I want to return to you. Thank you so much. Uh, we, you know, in the interest of time, I have only one question with this, much as I'd like to get questions from all of you, but I have one question, common question for all, the part, uh, for all my panelists here. Uh, originating from a very provocative statement that Johnny made when he said there'll be five generations of people in the workforce at some given time. So I did the rough math in 2030. If you say that 38% of India will be independent, I mean that will, will only be dependent and the rest of them will be out there in the workforce. We're looking at almost 600 to 700 million Indians. So panelists, please tell us here how do you think that we can work that challenge with this, of having, of having a population equal to the 
to po the population of your entire, all the countries sitting on the stage put together. And those are the guys who are going to, I mean, that's the number of people that are going to be in our workforce. What does India need to do? So starting from whoever. Well, uh, my, uh, my very quick thought is... Um, I'm, I'm going to write this down. <laughs> please. Nothing I say is ever so profound that it should be written down. For me, it is for all of us to experiment, to experiment with innovation and to keep doing it and not stop till we get aired right. And not to try to set things in stone too far in advance. Small pilots, key observations of success, don't be afraid to fail. All the things that you all know about innovation in your own businesses, we need to apply to the development of workforce and to the exciting challenge I think India has to how to generate a national system in a global world where you can try things out and have many successes, but also be prepared that there will be some things you try which won't work. But it's about, for me, innovation. Good one. Thank you. Bettina. Shobana, yes, I must say, I am so jealous when I hear these numbers because I am, you know, mainly in an environment where we're all talking about the aging population and all the people that are going to be missing in the labor market. And I mean, if there's one time where the term war on talent, you know, has been relevant, then it is now. We're going to see how countries are going to move into a bid for talent coming from outside because um, they don't have it in their own countries anymore. I mean, uh, Switzerland has, believe it or not, nine million people. I mean, this is almost <laughs> um, a joke uh, if, if we look at, uh, at the other numbers. Um, but a good, a, a good uh, almost million will be missing uh, by 2050. So imagine that. Now, Switzerland has been... Um, on top of all the rankings of innovation, of productivity, of um, uh, competitiveness, of, of attractiveness. Hmm, how is that going to work out if we don't have the people? So, jealousy on that one. I think the comment that I'd like to make here, Shabana, is, you know what I've learned is that in India, and there have been different numbers, so please don't quote me and I will use this number, 95% of the working population is in the informal economy. They do not have a contract. And luckily, of course, the Indian government has, while it has been working on getting a rocket to the moon, unbelievable, it has also been working on many other things. And one has been to create a platform <coughs> to allow people in the informal economy to register themselves so that they notably receive access to uh, benefits and so that they become discoverable to those who are able to provide them with jobs, which is something that, again, my industry um, is doing right now. So to come to that incredible number, I am just hoping that that percentage of people who will be in the formal economy, who will be able to benefit from, you know, a work contract and therefore everything that comes with it, that that proportion will not be the same, but that it will be exponentially higher. And that would be my wish and the focus, in my view, that, um, that uh, India should be driving as well. And my briefly is on a topic of diversity, equity and inclusion. The temptation is to focus on the six or 700,000 people, but what we know from countries who've been at this, 607 million people, is the notion that we could have a lot of volume, but not have participation from all. So it's not equal opportunity and equal access for all. Learning from the United States and a lot of what we learned is we focused in the beginning, so it was first about diversity, and then it was diversity inclusion, then it was diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, access, the terms have gone. What I would say to you is as you all began this journey, we were once young too, and what we didn't do, our population, was focus on inclusion. We actually are taking a position at Sherm that as opposed to D, E, and I, we're actually saying I, E, and D, lead with inclusion. It's a little bit of what Alan was saying. No matter the dimension, whether it's gender, 
you're going to have a significant number of women entering your workforce. Do they feel included? The mistake that other parts of the world, including the U.S., have done is we focused on representation, which was diversity. And we realized that our workforces could at once be diverse, but be divided. We realized that we could have a society that appeared to have diversity, but in fact, depending upon how you were born, male, female, what part of the world, rural versus the major cities, et cetera, that your opportunities were limited and you were there not being able, to, you were not able to participate in the economy as you would. So I would just leave you with this notion of inclusion should lead the work that you do with six or 700 million people so that you get the benefit of all of the best of your society. Well, Shabana, you know, when I think of your teenager chess genius who bet the Norwegian grandmaster just recently yes. in a chess tournament, I think you, you are, have a very bright future for your young generation in front of you because they're well educated, they want to achieve things. And um, the first pillar is, of course, that they will certainly be also participating in the Indian economy, which is growing at a pace much higher than most other economies right now. But the other point I think is so important for the future is if we really want to make sure that there is mobility, that there are win-win situations across our countries, we have to make sure that globalization is not, um, how shall I say, killed or hampered which we see today, whether it's uh, directly through geopolitical conflicts or indirectly through legislation. Um, for instance, at European Union, we have these due diligence legislations being proposed for supply chain um, due diligence or the carbon border adjustment mechanism, which again will have a protectionist effect, even if that's not the intention. <coughs> And of course, the US and many other countries aren't doing any better on uh, due diligence and uh, protectionist approaches. I think there, all governments need to make a change and to make sure that we go back to a really free-flowing international economic activity, globalization restarted again, relaunched. And that will also make sure that we have win-win situations with people moving mobility, professional mobility, coupled with geographical mobility. I think that will be uh, the basis for a good future. Thank you. Each one, fantastic point. Um, just, I'm only gonna build quickly on, uh, on Bettina's point, which is uh, India has, in the last few years, become the world leader on affording um, economic development through technology with Aadhaar, with the payment system, with upcoming developments in terms of platforms to support economic growth and interaction in India. Um, I think all of those things can vastly accelerate the continuing growth here in India, as well as the ability to interact internationally. I think the future is extremely bright, leaning on the innovative capability, uh, which India has already demonstrated and is now leading. You know, if it was left to me, I'd tear up those 60 pages and redraft this. <laughs> so, so with that, I think great insights. Thank you all very much for being such a good audience. Uh, apologies that the day took a little longer, but I'm sure that you had a very, very interesting um, evening and, and the perspectives we've heard are truly unique by world experts. Thank you again, panelists. You've been great. Thank you very much, Ms. Kamineni. Uh, we've got a little task for you to do. Uh, we've got gifts for all our speakers. May I request you to please uh, present them to them, uh, to no, each, each of them. Ladies and gentlemen, we are at the end of day two. A uh, reminder that we will be beginning early tomorrow, nine o'clock, so please be here on time. And uh, there's dinner arranged in 
Shah Jahan and the Raja Bagh. We also have the exhibition up on the lawns, so do find time if you haven't already been to visit the exhibition. Thank you to our panel. And if I could request you all to please just gather together for a photograph. It certainly has been the tallest panel that we've had all day now. So a fabulous set of speakers. Thank you very much. Please join us now for dinner in Shah Jahan and Rajabagh. And see you tomorrow. Thank you. India, the fastest growing major economy, setting development milestones in 25 years of Amrit Khan. The third largest economy by 2028, a developed nation by 2047.